Um, so I wanted to start, far, first start by outlining uh, our security assistance uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and there's been a lot of good questions about this, and we thought this would be a helpful rundown for all of you. It's the Department of Defense also put out a fact sheet that has this detailed as well. Uh, the security assistance the Biden administration is providing to Ukraine is enabling critical success on the battlefield against the Russian invading force. The number one reason that they are able to fight back is their bravery and courage. The number two reason is the security assistance uh, that we are providing and we are providing in coordination with our allies and partners. We are working around the clock to fulfill Ukraine's priority security assistance requests, delivering weapons from U.S. stocks when they are available and facilitating the delivery of weapons by allies and partners when their systems better suit Ukraine's needs. All of the anti-armor and anti-air systems from the two packages of security assistance the President approved in March have been delivered. Uh, we are continuing work with allies and partners to identify additional weapon systems to help the Ukrainian military defend its country. Obviously, there was a, the announcement about the S-300s uh, earlier today um, and our efforts to work uh, uh, to backfill that. Um, <clears throat> at President Zelensky's request, this includes helping Ukraine acquire long-range anti-aircraft systems and munitions that they are trained to use. More than 30 nations have sent Ukraine security assistance, thanks in part to the leadership of President Biden and diplomacy uh, that he has been implementing for months now. On April 5th, we announced an additional $100 million in security assistance to Ukraine through presidential drawdown authority. We also announced $300 million in security assistance on April 1st under authorities provided by the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. These announcements bring the U.S. commitment to more than $1.7 billion in security assistance since Russia's February 24th invasion and $2.4 billion since the beginning of the administration. I will not read through all of this for you. You can all of course, read it yourself, and we will provide uh, all of the list to all of you should, if you did not receive the Department of Defense fact sheet. Also wanted to note that today, according to a new independent study, the Biden administration's historic vaccination program saved 2.3 million lives in the United States, prevented 17 million hospitalizations and 66 million cases, and avoided $900 billion in health care costs. Over the past 15 months, the President has mounted a successful nationwide vaccination effort while executing a comprehensive strategy on treatments, testing, and more. As a result, schools are open, our economy is booming, and importantly, today's report shows we've spared millions of families the immeasurable loss that too many others have suffered. And because of the President's comprehensive response, we've entered a new moment in our fight against the virus. While COVID isn't over, Americans now have more tools than ever before to protect themselves, and this country is moving forward safely, back to uh, many of our more normal routines. Unfortunately, Republicans in Congress are holding up critical funding we need to make even more progress to save even more lives uh, and to stay prepared against any potential surges or variants. Inaction will leave our nation less prepared for future surges and variants. It will mean fewer vaccines, treatments, and tests for the American people. This is deeply disappointing, and it should be unacceptable to every American. I also wanted to give you a sense of the week ahead. <clears throat> Just one trip. Uh, next week that we announced earlier today, at this point, uh, there could be more. On Thursday, the President will travel to Greensboro, North Carolina, to discuss uh, his administration's efforts to make more in America, rebuild our supply chains here at home, and bring down costs for the American people as part of building a better America. Following that trip, he will travel to Camp David, where he will remain over the Easter weekend. And then finally, as I've been doing a little bit this week, I just want to shout out some amazing colleagues I have. Lewis, who we have stolen from FEMA, not really stolen, he's a detail, oh, well, he's, he's a fellow, actually. Um, we've had him since November. Soon they will steal him back. Um, and Lewis has been remarkable. Lewis uh, has been reading Russian media, which comes in use, uh, in great use. Uh, he has been tracking down uh, a range of coverage about the war in Ukraine. He has been uh, un relentless uh, in, uh, in giving us updates and providing us information, and we're incredibly grateful to Lewis, and we'll be sad to see you go back to FEMA to do very important work. 
Uh, many of you know Amanda Finney. I call her the mayor because she knows every person seemingly who works in the building and on the complex, which is about 2,000 people. I would not survive this job without Amanda Finney. You probably would all not have received all the help you have received about a range of things without Amanda Finney. She is smart, sassy, level-headed, stable. Uh, she's remarkable. And uh, we may all work for her one day in some capacity. I certainly may, uh, but I am very grateful to her. So just wanted to shout that out. And her yellow suit is very joyful for a joyful day. Okay, with that, it's a Friday. It's a Friday. Thanks so much. Uh, I've got a couple things. Sure. Um, first on this, uh, the, the missile attack at this train station. Does the uh, administration think that Russia might have intentionally targeted the train station, knowing that there would be a lot of civilians there? Well, what we've seen over the course of the last six weeks or uh, more than that um, has been um, what the president himself has characterized as uh, war crimes, which is the intentional targeting uh, of civilians. This is yet another horrific atrocity committed by Russia, striking civilians who are trying to evacuate and reach safety. Where we are now is we're going to support efforts to investigate the, this attack as we document Russia's actions, hold them accountable, and we will continue to surge security assistance and weapons deliveries to help Ukraine defend their country. Obviously, the targeting of civilians would certainly be a war crime, and we've already called a range of the actions we've seen to date a war crime, but we're going to be supporting efforts to investigate exactly what happened here. Okay, uh, changing topics. Uh, senior administration officials have, have, have said publicly gone on TV uh, suggesting it's possible the president could get COVID. Um, I'm wondering, is the administration attempting to prepare the public for the possibility of the, the president getting the testing positive? Well, what we're trying to do is be as transparent and direct with the American people uh, as possible about the fact that uh, while well, the president um, is uh, takes a range of protocols, we have a range of protocols in place here that are aligned and even beyond uh, the CDC requirements. Um, those include, as we've outlined here uh, many times in the past, uh, testing before you see the president, testing before you travel with him, social distancing when possible. Uh, we believe we have the tools and protocol uh, to uh, to address uh, this point. We are in uh, in the virus, but. But like anyone else, uh, the president may at some point uh, test positive for COVID. Uh, and while we have seen uh, an increase uh, in recent, I would just note, while we have seen an increase in cases uh, around people, I should just say that some of us may know. Um, I would also note that cases remain down 95% since the height of Omicron. Uh, that is fact. That is data. Even as we've seen cases of people, we know. But what is important for the American people to know is that he has taken a range of precautions, as we all have, but he's also taken steps like getting the second booster, as he did last week in public. Um, and uh, his doctors uh, are comfortable uh, that he could continue to carry out his duties uh, because of all these steps and precautions and protections he's taken. Uh, and, and we certainly, that's one of the reasons we encourage the rest of the American public to do the same. Go ahead. Do you, if this is the first time that we've heard uh, White House officials sort of describe it as a certain possibility that the president could get COVID, are, are you saying that you think it's more possible now given sort of the little outbreak that we're seeing in DC right now? No, we're just saying that it is a possibility. Again, we are, cases are down 95% across the country since the height of Omicron. Uh, while cases are up in Washington, D.C., they're also far below the height of the cases and where they were in Omicron. But it is also the case that despite all of the precautions we take, and even with the president being double boosted, he could still test positive for COVID. Just as People in the, many people in the White House have, many people in the press corps have. That is a possibility, and we want to be transparent with the American public about that. By our rough count here, you have at least 18 politicians and people close to the president who've now tested positive this week. I mean, you've reiterated all the extra precautions that you are taking to try and keep him safe, some of the extra uh, masking and testing protocol. But just to be safe, have you considered uh, maybe cutting down some of the big indoor events or scaling back any, uh, changing sort of your tactic with some of these events? Well, clearly we did the event, uh, the historic event today outside that was in part to ensure that we could have a huge number of people on the South Lawn celebrating uh, the confirmation of uh, Justice Kentaji Brown Jackson. But also we know that having events outside is uh, better for safety protocols. There's no question about that. But what's important for the American people to, to know and understand is that because of all the steps we've taken, because the president is double boosted, uh, because uh, of, you know, obviously he has access to the best health care in the world, but his doctors have assessed that these are risks that can be taken 
we risk assess just like everybody out in the country. And it's important for him to be able to continue his presidential duties now and even if he tests positive in the future. Just like Americans out there in the country are taking their kids to school, they go to the grocery store, uh, maybe they're making a decision to go to dinner. Uh, this is a time where we are certainly living with the virus, but we have a range of tools at our disposal to do that. Go ahead. Um, thanks, Jen. A couple of quick questions on oil and then one on the French election. Um, we have some reporting showing that the administration is considering uh, e easing sanctions to allow some oil imports from Venezuela as a uh, way to replace uh, banned energy shipments from Russia. Uh, can you talk a little bit about any such considerations? I'm not aware of that being under consideration. Okay. Uh, okay. At, at the moment, is it is it going to perhaps be considered for going it, forward? It has or? not been, uh, so I'm not aware of being under consideration. Okay. And and uh, one other one on when uh, Dalip was in India, mm -hmm. uh, he delivered this uh, warning to India to not raise uh, purchases of Russian oil. And we were wondering if uh, perhaps sanctions along similar lines are being considered for other nations, asking them to keep purchases of Russian oil only limited to previous levels and perhaps not. First, I, I wouldn't characterize it as a warning, nor did we at the time. He went and had a constructive conversation and made clear that while it's the decision of each individual country, including India, to determine whether they're going to import Russian oil, it is only 1 to 2 percent of their imports. T about 10 percent of their imports is from the United States. And so he conveyed, of course, they should abide by sanctions, uh, which are not related to that decision, but also we would be here to help them diversify um, uh, and move towards re even reducing further beyond the 1 to 2 percent. Is that, is that decision perhaps being relayed also to other countries, asking them to perhaps follow the same guidelines? Well, we conveyed every country to abide by sanctions. And we've conveyed to a range of European countries, as you know, and as we've talked about, that as they work to diversify their energy sources, uh, that we are here to assist in those efforts. And there are a range of steps we've taken, including uh, efforts on LNG. I mean, that's natural gas, of course, but efforts on LNG and moving some resources from Asia and other places, and ensuring that there are options to, uh, for any country that wants to, to diversify their energy sources. Okay, and one on the French elections. Sure. Um, are you watching the French elections uh, uh, coming up this Sunday, perhaps with any concerns, especially with the rise of uh, uh, Le Pen, who is a far-right candidate running against Macron? Uh, we are certainly watching the elections, uh, but I don't have any prediction of what the outcome will be. And once there is an outcome, I'm sure we will speak to it. Go ahead. Um, understanding it's a fluid situation, but the atrocities in Bucha uh, serve as an accelerant towards the, the latest sanctions package, um, the coordination between that we announced uh, two days yes. ago. Yes. Um, is there any sense that the strike that we saw this morning will also accelerate talks on additional sanctions between the coordinated allies? Well, I would say just go, to go back to a couple of days ago, that obviously the sanctions package we announced on Wednesdays uh, with some the, the biggest bank in Russia, Spare Bank, uh, certainly that was augmented. Uh, as a result of uh, the atrocities that we were seeing in Bucha. And what we have done to date, and we will continue to do, is look at, unfortunately, the continued atrocities that we're seeing in the country and assess how that's going to impact sanctions, consequences, and obviously additional security assistance. So that's how we've been evaluating and working with our allies to date. Uh, and I'm certain, uh, given uh, the, the video footage we've seen on, on airwaves across the world and photos, uh, that this will be a part of the discussion that our national security officials are having with their counterparts moving forward. Okay. Um, on the S-300, mm -hmm. um, it's been fairly apparent for the last several weeks that that was a process that you guys were engaged in. Yeah. Um, I know you are deliberately ambiguous as to some of the other processes that may be taking place, but is it fair to say that there are multiple other tracks that are similarly far down the line for other weapon systems, or, or how can you characterize how far along you are uh, compared to where you are now at the S-300 on other systems? So, well, well, one, I mean, part of our objective here, and the S-300s are, are an example of that, is to see that we can get defensive equipment uh, that Ukrainians are trained on and that we know uh, it can be effective move to Ukraine. So we are, of course, grateful uh, to Slovakia, and we work closely with Slovakia to also meet their defense needs. And part of our considerations here as we're looking at the list of requests that the Ukrainians have is 
What do we have access to here in the United States? What military equipment uh, do we have access to? There are systems we may not have access access to, or may, we may not even have those systems. So how can we work with countries around the world, like Slovakia, to meet those needs? So there are a range of those conversations happening with our partners and allies at the same time. I, I will tell you that uh, often it is the preference of these partners and allies not to be public about these conversations. And at times, it is the preference of the Ukrainians. And we certainly respect that. There's one final one. Um, it's been a pretty historic 24 hours yeah. uh, for the history of the Supreme Court, for the country. Um, we've seen the president speak publicly. Can you talk about the Vinnie Color in terms of what he's been like behind the scenes, delivering on a campaign pledge for yeah. the first African American woman on the court, how he's been with staff, with the sure. justice, all that? Sure. Um, oh, I'm going to try not to ugly cry about this day, cause which we, all, we were all doing on the South Lawn. Look, I, I was with the president before he uh, went out. Um, I, I was there on time. I didn't run out, as you would have seen. Uh, I was with him before uh, when he was reviewing his, made, doing his final review of his remarks. And what he was reflecting on is, um, and you saw some of this in his speech, uh, were the number of people, whether it is people who work at the White House, uh, people who are part of his everyday, uh, you know, stewards or others who have commented to him how significant this moment is and how, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a place where you are just, Trying to, trying to make it through every day. Uh, and every day is history in many ways. Uh, history can be heartbreaking, and many days it has been. History can be exhausting, and many days it has been. And history can be joyful. And today was a joyful day in history. Uh, and that is certainly how the president was. You saw his granddaughter, Naomi, uh, who he talked about in the speech, come out. Uh, she was there also uh, for a brief greet uh, with, uh, with uh, Justice Jackson um, beforehand. Uh, and he made, a, made uh, an effort to also introduce uh, the, the new associate justice to some members of his close staff who just were inspired by the significance of today as well. So I would say there was a deep recognition of uh, this moment of history, a joy in uh, reaching it, and I think we've all been saying to each other in the hallways, no one can steal our, steal our sunshine today because uh, that's how everybody uh, is feeling. Sure. Go ahead. Hey, Jen, um, to follow up on that, did the President spend any time with the Jackson family before the formal event or afterward? Well, I think as we confirmed, uh, she signed uh, her commission, or he signed her commission, and her family was with her for that. So it was briefly before he came out to do the remarks. Okay, got it. Um, and to follow up on a question from Katie earlier this week about other precautions mm -hmm. that the President may or may not be taking, do you know if he is taking any monoclonal antibodies to help prevent catching COVID? Well, Evisheld is for immunocompromised. That would be the preemptive step, and he's not immunocompromised, so he's not taking Evisheld. Is he taking any other medication that might help? Like what? Um, well, I don't actually know. <laughs> That's a great question. Other than the booster, um, you know, we've heard other people taking um, other kinds of prophylactics to prevent it. Is he taking anything that you know of? There, there are not other, this is why I asked, there are not other, I mean, Evisheld is obviously one that if you're immunocompromised is something that's been approved and recommended since he does not categorize that way, he isn't taking it. But other than that, the precautions we're taking are, he obviously got the booster when he was eligible um, uh, last week. And, uh, you know, we take additional steps, including testing, socially distanced meetings when possible. Um, as well in order to protect him as much as possible. Thank you. And then just one more on um, something that Samantha Power shared. Sure. She said that Russian forces have killed at least seven journalists in Ukraine in six weeks and that Putin soldiers are killing journalists at an unprecedented rate. Is there any intelligence, um, any information that Putin is targeting journalists? And do you have any warning that you're sharing with American journalists? Uh, covering the war? Well, um, w one, we, we value the role that American journalists and journalists from around the world, that felt like a direction somewhere, so, um, uh, have played in, um, in, uh, in bringing, uh, light, bringing to light for a lot of people in this country uh, this war, what's happening, the devastation, the horrors. Um, it has been a, has a direct impact on people's emotional response in the United States. There's no question about that. Uh, we recognize the war of journalists in war zones, of course, and value it. And, and as you all know, we also work very closely with leaders of news organizations to ensure that they have up-to-date information to keep members of their media organizations safe. It is still a war zone, an active war zone, and we're still 
conveying that Americans should not be there, right, including journalists. Um, in terms of specific targeting, we knew from the beginning, and we have talked publicly about this, of course, that President Putin and the Russian military was going to target, uh, was intending to target, or could target civilians and others, um, including uh, journalists could be part of that. But um, I don't have anything, any new intelligence or anything beyond that. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Is there a carve out in CDC regulations for COVID for the vice president? Tell me more, Peter. I'm sure this is going somewhere. Let's well, see. You know, the what CD do you got for me on a Friday? The CDC says for people exposed to COVID, up to date on their COVID-19 vaccinations, do not go to places where you are unable to wear a well-fitting mask. So why is she here at the White House today, giving the new Supreme Court justice a big hug with no mask. You mean when she gave her a, mask, a hug outside? Yes. She was outside. Does the CDC uh, say the people who are in close contact can give people hugs outside? We know, Peter, that outside it is uh, it is a, you are it's you can benefit significantly being outside. That's why we have we had the event outside today. I will tell you that the vice president has been wearing a mask inside. When there was a private greet, they were all wearing masks. Uh, uh, we before they she went wasn't up, wearing a mask yesterday at the Senate. The, she was uh, playing an important role in in confirming or overseeing the confirmation of the first black woman to the Supreme Court. The vast majority, is, as was on the camera, Peter, as was on camera. Let me finish my that. answer here because Fox and others, I don't know actually that Fox carried it, but others did, uh, saw that she was so socially distanced from people for the vast, vast majority of her time overseeing uh, that confirmation yesterday. So this is not a case of rules for the, but not for VP. In fact, the vice president wore a mask inside today when she was uh, it both with the president, with her staff, other people. She was outside at the event. She was socially distanced for 99.9% .9 of the event today, and she had an emotional moment, as which is understandable. Okay, and one other topic. Following up on the smartphones that are being given to border crossers with technology so they can be uh, tracked or so they can check in, is there any plan to give free smartphones to U.S. citizens that want them? Should we not be tracking uh, migrants who irregularly cross the border? I'm asking if... Or do you have an alternative suggestion for how they should be tracked? I, unfortunately, have not been asked to make U.S. immigration policy. Uh, that's not Today's my... your moment. Well, <laughs> it'd be great if uh, anybody that wanted a free phone and a free monthly plan could get one. So is that going to be an offer for everybody or just people that walk into the country illegally? Well, Peter, as when we talked about this the other day, uh, what I noted to you is that we have a range of means of tracking individuals who irregularly migrate to the country. Uh, as in, in to order to ensure that they are meeting their notice to appear obligations uh, and that they are appearing in court when they should appear in court. Phones is one of them. There are also ankle devices and a range of tracking devices. 80% uh, of individuals have, of non-citizens released at the border from DHS custody under prosecutorial discretion have either received a notice to appear or are still within the window to report. So yes, there's telephonic reporting. There is smart link, which enables participant monitoring via smartphone. There's the global positioning system. These are the range of means with modern technology that we monitor. Last one on this. Does the president have any plans to figure out what these small towns who are bracing for a major influx in migrants next month need by making his first ever trip to the border? I have nothing to predict for you in terms of additional trips. The president will be traveling the country, uh, but I don't have any more specifics for you at this point. Just Thanks for, clarity, for the question. Earlier, you guys told us via pool that the president was tested net tested negative. That was today for clarity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the cadence has clearly changed, right? We knew there was one on Wednesday. He was negative. Today's Friday. He tested negative. Just for keeping track mm -hmm. of it, is it now three times a week, two times a week? Is there a way that his doctor it? makes an assessment on how many times you should be tested, and we do our best to provide that information to you as he's tested. And aside from the time he spent with Kajani. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, her family. There was no, because there's precedent to this, there was no indoor reception, indoor ceremony that existed, some kind that cameras didn't see no. before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me, if I can, during his remarks today, the president said something that was a bit striking. He was condemning some of the conservative Republicans and their criticisms uh, of Judge Jackson, which he was testifying recently. He said there was verbal abuse, the anger, the constant interruptions, those vile basis, vile assertions, and accusations. Is that a preview of messaging that we're going to hear from the president heading into the midterms? Was that was that is that a message that the White House wants to deliver and we'll be repeating? I don't believe that the conduct of senators at a hearing is going to be central to uh, the president's remarks when he's out in 
uh, out traveling the country. Uh, but I think what he was speaking to on a historic day is that, well, Judge Jackson was the picture, now Justice Jackson, was the picture of dignity in her hearings. Some others in the room decided to be the opposite. And he is somebody who has more experience overseeing Supreme Court hearings than anyone living. Uh, he has overseen uh, them during Republican and Democratic presidents and expects a certain level of conduct, professionalism, and decorum. And that is not what we saw. For today, as opposed to like a central theme that we'll see in terms of contrast. I would say that uh, that uh, I think the American people can expect that he'll continue to talk when he's out in the country for whatever reason about how to bring down their costs, uh, how to make sure that he is fighting for them uh, and bringing them relief, and how he's going to get the COVID pandemic under control. Less about the conduct of senators at a hearing. Let me ask a very quick question then on costs, if I can. Right now, the cost of gas in this country, on average, is four dollars and fourteen cents. Does the White House want a gas tax holiday? It is certainly on the table um, and certainly something we continue to consider. Um, we have seen a number of states do that. And well, um, you know, it can have an impact, about 18 cents, I believe, if I remember correctly. Uh, one of the reasons why we're considering it, uh, the, the, our primary focus to date, as you all know, has been taking steps to increase supply uh, and get, it, um, get more supply into the global marketplace. But it remains an option under consideration. Go ahead. The, the UN today uh, put out a report saying that global food prices in March reached a record high. Yeah. Uh, what is the U.S. doing, if anything, to uh, mitigate uh, possible additional increases here? Uh, here in the United States? Correct. Uh, well, it is something that we are certainly watching very closely while we, while we continue to believe that the impact will largely be in the Middle East and uh, in Africa, I believe, uh, in a lot of, uh, you know, other parts of the world less in the United States. Um, we are continuing to work, our Department of Agriculture is continuing to work with farmers and suppliers about any needs we have here. Uh, and the President is continuing to work to bring down costs in a range of areas for the American people as we prepare for the impacts of this war. It was pretty widely reported yesterday uh, prior to her uh, COVID uh, diagnosis that Speaker Pelosi was planning a trip to Taiwan. Uh, Beijing reacted very negatively to that. Are, is the U.S., is the Biden administration comfortable if, if she were to do that, such a high-ranking U.S. official? I don't, I think we understood her trip. I don't have any further comments on it. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jen. Two questions for you. The first, uh, today my colleagues in the U.K. reported that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Rishi Sunak, had a U.S. green card which he surrendered this past October. Uh, he's been an MP uh, since 2015, and uh, USCIS manual says that serving in a foreign government or standing for election in a foreign government is not compatible with lawful permanent resident status. Uh, why was this not flagged earlier? I would point you to the State Department or the Department of Homeland Security. I don't have any more is, comment is it, from here. I mean, is it, a, is it a problem? Does the President see it as a problem that possible for someone to serve at a high level in a foreign government and maintain lawful permanent resident status in the U.S.? I mean, what if this were someone who was serving in the Russian Duma? It wasn't. Uh, but I would also, again, point you to uh, the portions of the government that oversee uh, green cards and oversee, uh, you know, the status of, of documents. I, I'm happy to bump it for them as well and see if there's more That's we can provide to you. Second question. Uh, there's a death row inmate in Texas, uh, Melissa Lucio. She's set to be executed soon. Uh, many experts believe her confession was coerced and is false. Uh, she has bipartisan support for clemency and support from uh, the EU uh, and many other uh, foreign allies. Uh, would the president consider asking Governor Abbott to intervene? Well, you know the president's um, position and view on the death penalty, and there's an ongoing review at the Department of Justice at a federal level. No. This is obviously at a state level. Right. I don't have anything to predict. And then a follow up. That. Given his commitment to police reform, would he consider asking the DOJ to prohibit police departments that uh, receive federal funds from using uh, the read technique for interrogations? It's considered to uh, create a lot of uh, false confessions. Well, again, I, I know the Department of Justice has taken a number of steps, including on uh, chokeholds and other uh, other actions that needed to be reformed in police departments across the country. I don't have anything to preview or predict in terms of additional steps. The president supports their efforts to do more. Many of them have talked about their desire to do more. And obviously, we are continuing to consider an executive order on police reform here, given there has been an inability of Congress to move forward. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, there are some pretty desperate images coming out of Shanghai right now, which is under lockdown for COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, 
people begging for food and, and medicine. Uh, is the White House monitoring that? Um, is there anything the U.S. can do to help the humanitarian situation there? And also on the supply chain front, um, is the administration aware of any further supply chain snags uh, coming as a result of this and how are you prepared to address them? Sure. Well, first, on the, the, on the first part of your question, uh, the, the State Department is closely monitoring uh, the situation. Uh, they are pro providing consistent updates of the situation on the ground and will certainly assess with USAID and others if there's additional assistance that could be provided. Uh, on the supply chain uh, component, uh, what we know is that uh, the port is continuing to operate normally and where we're seeing the impacts, which, which still could, could have an impact over the course of time, of course, is uh, factories, warehouses, and trucking where we are seeing um, uh, shutdowns within the region, which we know could cause delays, especially for air cargo as well. Uh, because this is just happening, uh, we don't have a prediction at this point on how that could impact bigger global supply chain issues. It depends on a lot of factors, how long, et cetera. Um, but it is something we are closely monitoring, um, and it is something we will continue to work um, to, uh, to address if, if it extends uh, farther. And there's one more housekeeping item. Do you have a timing update on when the president might sign the uh, trade preference bill on Russia that passed? I don't, and I know you and others have been looking for this. And let me see if I can get an answer before we all wrap up today. Go ahead. Jen, um, could you speak to the efficacy of sanctions? I know there was a new sanctions package rolled out this week. Um, and initially, we heard a lot from administration officials about this being a deterrent. I know that has changed. Um, and so can you speak to sort of the end goal and what is the efficacy of sanctions? Well, I would say that. Um, uh, it has. We have a couple of objectives um, at this point as it relates to the war in Ukraine. One is to uh, impose uh, severe consequences, uh, send a marker uh, for the world and for history uh, about the, uh, the horrific nature of these atrocities. Um, these consequences, and the second part of our objective is to ensure that these consequences are having a significant impact on the economy in Russia. We're seeing an inflationary rate of about 15 percent, a projection of a uh, contraction of 15 percent in the Russian economy. 600 private sector companies have left Russia. We know it is having the impact that the world intended. This is the most significant coordinated set of sanctions ever done in history on this large of an economy. The third objective here is to make it much more difficult for President Putin to fund his war. And if you look back, say, earlier this week at the example of uh, the bond payments and how uh, Russia has basically been put in a decision of, uh, in a place where they uh, either have to use their limited resources they have that are also being used to fund the war uh, to prevent a default or default. Um, that is the position they are in at this point in time, but also because we have cut them off through export controls and a number of other means from having access to materials and technology, but also access to funds, it makes it more difficult for them to fund the war. That is part of it. And the last objective uh, is to continue to make it clear that this is a, uh, a strategic blunder, their, their decision to invade Ukraine, um, and, um, and one that will make President Putin a pariah in the world. So those are why and what we are hoping to achieve. Can I ask one follow-up? Yeah. Is there anything being done uh, in terms of either monitoring or, or actually just, I, I guess, monitoring to take a look at the effects of sanctions on ordinary Russians or anything that the administration is thinking um, to just deal with that population of people who are being affected? The Russian people, yes, you correct. mean. Um, yes. certain, I mean, certainly we are looking at uh, how this is impacting the Russian economy writ large. And it is certainly, as, as inflation is going up and as the economy is contracting, that means prices will go up. And we do know there will be a broad impact. That is the fault of President Putin and the fault of President Putin invading a sovereign country. Uh, so it is important also for the Russian people to know and understand that. And we have been working through a range of means to communicate about the realities of the war and the facts of the war through Telegram, through YouTube, through a range of channels as well. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, General Milley earlier this week talked about the possibility of building a permanent U.S. bases on NATO's eastern flank. I wonder with what seriousness the White House has given that, or if you look long term at the war in Ukraine, whether shoring up the eastern flank with permanent bases is something that's been considered. Uh, there will continue to be a range of discussions, but I have nothing beyond what General Milley said. Can I ask one more question? I wanted to go a little deeper on the French elections. Sure. Does the White House worry that the election of Le Pen could, you know, destabilize the NATO alliance or make it difficult, being that she's, you know, come out with pro-Russian statements? 
well, I'm just not going to get ahead of an election in a foreign country. Um, and obviously, we will watch it closely, and I'm sure we'll have more to speak to once the c results are concluded. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, what can you tell us about the multiple Secret Service agents who have been suspended or removed from the president, vice president, and first lady's <coughs> detail pending this investigation of, of two men impersonating um, uh, the officers of law enforcement? Not much from here. I can point you to the Secret Service, and obviously the FBI is overseeing the investigation. Is there a broader concern in, in the administration that these principals, is there concern that they're not being protected effectively? Is, can you speak at all to that? or? I, as I said yesterday, we, the President remains confident in the leader of the Secret Service, um, and beyond that, I would point you to the Secret Service and to the FBI. And then I guess just on the invitations you issued to Republicans who voted to confirm uh, Justice Jackson. I know one of them has COVID, but um, did you hear from the other two, Senator Murkowski and Romney? I know the president um, went a little further to talk about Senator Romney's father today uh, at, at his speech. Did the White House hear from the Republicans who were invited today? Why didn't they come? I, I would point you to their offices to speak to that. I mean, it doesn't change the president's gratitude uh, to them for uh, you know, bucking the trend uh, in, in their party of uh, not supporting an eminently qualified uh, nominee. Uh, and they, they did that, um, and it was something he wanted to call out today and, and express his gratitude. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jen. I'm wondering what the White House's reaction is to yesterday's UN vote to suspend Russia from the UN uh, Human Rights Council. The fact that there were 58 nations that abstained um, from taking a vote and then on top of the other 24 nations that voted against it. Although there was you know, more, obviously, the majority of countries did vote to suspend Russia. Do you think that this, uh, you know, that many abstains, abstentions, that many people sitting on the sidelines of this shows that the entire world really isn't unified around uh, uh, condemning these actions by Russia? Well, a win required two-thirds present in voting, uh, and that is exactly what happened, and, and far beyond that. Uh, and we know that there were um, uh, abstentions, and only 24 countries, including North Korea, uh, voted uh, with Russia. But the outcome, which is what, what is most important to us, is what we wanted, which is Russia has been suspended from the UN Human Rights Council. Suspension, just so everybody knows, somebody asked me this question the other day, but is the only method provided for in the UN resolution that established the Human Rights Council back in 2005. It's the most serious action available. It's only been applied once in history. This is only the second time in history that a country has been kicked out of the UN Human Rights Council. The last example was Libya. So that obviously speaks to the significance. And it also speaks to the fact that the two thirds, more than two thirds, of countries who are members. Um, are um, believe that they should not have a leadership role uh, on global human rights as they work to subvert and violate global human rights. Uh, this also means that once suspended, Russia will not be able to vote against future actions during subsequent Human Rights Council sessions. And so uh, to us, it is significant, only the second time in, second time in history, and it speaks to uh, the global outrage uh, in response to these atrocities. But are there any concerns that nearly 60 nations uh, decided not to weigh in on this matter? Again, our focus is on the fact that it was a win for only the second time in history was a country kicked out of, suspended from the UN Human Rights uh, Council. Another question. Uh, does President Biden still attend, uh, intend uh, to attend the White House Correspondents Association uh, uh, dinner here later this month in a couple weeks? We haven't announced his plans to attend or anything about his schedule, so I don't have any update on that. In student loans uh, and student debt, he'd be happy to sign it. Go ahead. Last one, last one, last one. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, um, Rachel Wallace, who was the general counsel of the science office, who the White House found had been bullied by Dr. Lander, has been told that she will not be getting her job back as general counsel. Uh, why? I'm not aware of this personnel update. I'd have to check on it. I'm sh happy to do that, and we will get you back a comment. Right. Uh, then a follow-up. Yesterday, you said, when asked about uh, Vice President Harris's and the mask at the Senate, you said that she would follow CDC protocols at the event today. CDC protocols clearly say you should be wearing a mask. It doesn't distinguish between outside and inside. So why didn't she wear a mask? And she was socially distanced for the vast majority of the event today. She was sitting standing next to the president about six feet away. Thanks,